etiquette to do the honors, it just slips right out every time, to do the honors of introducing Chief Master Sergeant of the U.S. Air Force, Joanne Bass. For us shorties, I have to move this down here. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, and hey, everyone, we made it. What a fantastic conference it's been, right? I will use this opportunity to once again thank Bill Clifford for all of his blood, sweat, and tears, not only this year, but every year. It's been an honor. Um, so this is an honor for me to be able to introduce to you uh, the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Joanne Bass. Uh, some of you know that about two and a half weeks ago, I participated in a program called the Joint Civilian Orientation Conference. And it was a week where I spent with leaders of business and leaders of community organizations from around the United States. And we, we had a day with every single branch of the United States military. This was a truly transformational experience, not because I rolled in an Osprey or flew in a C-130 or got to rappel down a 500-foot wall, <laughs> but, but because um, the Air Force nominated me, and I will forever be indebted to the Air Force, but what I learned most during that week is that what we have that is very special in our United States military are our people. It was extraordinary, um, and I, I, it, it was something I'll never forget, and I will tell everybody I know how wonderful our services are. So I know you didn't come here to hear me, so without further ado, please welcome Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Joanne Bass. Good afternoon. So um, first of all, thank you for allowing me to speak during dessert and coffee, because that makes everything better, right? <laughs> and then also, Megan, thank you so much for that um, warm introduction. The fact that Megan flew around um, our United States in a C-130, by the way, how many, has anybody else flown on a C-130? The fact that she's flown on a C-130 and didn't get sick <laughs> means that she is an airman for life. And so um, with that, you know, I, we have options to a whole lot of planes and yeah, I'll just leave it there. Um, so anyway, it's so exciting. I'm so very excited to be here. And I'll tell you, it makes my heart super happy to be in a room with fellow Americans that are coming together to talk about, and more importantly, to really get after um, the things that impact this world that we live in. It is a true honor to also have sh shared the stage with some amazing speakers that you have had over this past week. Um, you've had Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, General Philippe Levine, Ambassador Jovanovich, Dr. Fiona Hill, and then I have no idea how somehow you have me. Um, <laughs> But to that end, I will say, Bill, thank you so much for the invitation and to the entire WACO organization. Um, thank you for your generous invitation to speak here with you all this afternoon. Um, to every single one of you, to our community, to our um, academic and industry leaders, I am super encouraged, as I mentioned, um, and inspired by your care for global issues and policies that impact all of us. I'm also encouraged and deeply appreciative of your support to our military service members and their families. And as the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, I'm honored to stand before you and represent the nearly 685,000 total force, uniformed and non-uniformed airmen that serve in your great Air Force. Um, I'm honored to share with you how your influence your advocacy and your support toward national security is really critical to getting after this thing that we call the whole of nation. And I'd offer we need that more now than ever, especially in this time of great power competition where our nation is not short of challenges and neither is our military. Challenges like the topic that you've been covering this whole week, navigating a fractured world. I'll admit while I'm a big optimist when it comes to this world that we live in, 
No one can debate that these past few years have been incredibly tough. They've tested us. They've tested our resolve in ways that none of us could have perhaps foreseen. A global pandemic, civil unrest, war in the Ukraine, and the ever-looming threat of climate change have put extreme pressures on the foundation of our global order. You couple that with strategic competition that is seeking to outpace us, outmodernize us, and even outthink us. And with the information environment that seems to bombard us every second of every day with content that seems to specifically bring out sometimes the worst in us, it's easy to see how our world might seem fractured. And while all these things that impact our world may seem to live outside of the fence line of a military installation, they absolutely have great impact on our airmen and certainly on their families as well. Yet despite these impacts, I'm encouraged because throughout my travels, and by the way, we're heading out to the Middle East tonight, but throughout my travels, we get to visit with our service members and their families. Um, and we also, in addition to the challenges, get to see the very best that America has to offer. I'm encouraged because I get to see airmen, your airmen, that are empowered by the challenges that we face and they work tirelessly to overcome them to ensure that our nation is safe. Not just for themselves, not for just their families, but for all of you, for everybody. I'm encouraged because I see communities, your communities, open their arms to our airmen, their spouses, their kiddos, and give them a much needed sense of home and belonging. So to you, I say thank you. And I see leaders like those in this room working hand in hand with the Air Force and other defense officials to get after modernizing our military to prepare for future conflict if it should arise. And boy, do we need to really focus on modernizing our military. In fact, when I talk with our airmen, I often share that we are at an inflection point in history where the decisions that we make today will resonate far into the future, into their future. And that is why this whole of nation approach is needed, especially when it comes to problem solving. Each of us has a stake in this impending strategic competition that is talked about in our national security strategy and our national defense strategy. And we need leaders of all kinds and in all areas of expertise to come together to work toward shared values and common goals. And in my line of business, the profession of arms, I am certain about one thing, Future conflict will never, ever look like conflict in the past. It will never look like wars of the past. While the character of war will not change much, how we fight and how it is weaponized will absolutely change. And today's ways of warfare is changing. When I first came in, we were primarily focused on air, land, and sea. You had to have a strong army, a strong air force, a strong navy. 30 years later, conflict has changed and includes any and all domains, air, land, sea, space, cyber, and information. And oh, by the way, we have adversaries that will never ever fight a fair fight. And you need to know that. They will use any and all domains if they're able to. In fact, if they can beat us in the latter three, space, air, or space, information, and cyber, they ultimately win. If they can beat us in those latter three, we can't even generate the air power that we need to be able to dominate the high ground, which is why I couldn't be more excited that we actually have a US Space Force. By the way, they're turning three years old in uh, next month, so they're out of their terrible twos almost. <laughs> they're kind of like a teenager sometimes because they come to us for a lot of money. Um, but if we lose, I couldn't be more excited that we have a space force. If we lose in space, what every American needs to know is we lose, period. You can't put gas in your car. You can't get money out of an ATM. You can't even call home if we lose in space. Um, if we lose in cyber, well, you know what that means. And when it comes to air power, what I would offer to you is the demand for air, the demand signal for air power has never been greater. In fact, every single service relies on air power to be able to compete, deter, and to win, and to defend our homeland. And when it comes to that deterrence, as Megan outlined, it is without a doubt that it is the strength 
of the people. It is a strength of your airmen. It is a strength of the service members and the other services that make our adversaries pause for just a moment and say, we're not gonna try today. So deterrence what works, folks, and that is our goal as an Air Force and certainly as a joint force, and we deliver every single day. So before I transition, though, from air power and deterrence, if I can just take a quick commercial break and, and pause and talk about um, that other domain that I talked about, which was information, um, something that I don't think that we talk about enough and none of us can continue to be passive observers. Our information domain is absolutely a battle space, and it brings me great concern. It is important to know that adversaries are weaponizing information at speed, scale, and scope. And they are able to leverage things like social media and digital media and the information environment to directly impact the people, the readiness of, and the culture of our nation, our government, our militaries, and especially in our Air Force. Because of my concern, I published an article earlier this year called A New Kind of War. So if you have some free time, feel free to Google A New Kind of War. And in this article, I speak about the challenges associated with information warfare, how information warfare impacts every single one of us, regardless of whether or not you wear this uniform. It impacts our airmen, it impacts our veterans, it impacts our families, it impacts you, and it certainly impacts me. Information warfare, or what I sometimes call it, influence operations, threatens to disrupt our way of life and to some degree our will to fight as a unified nation. And every single one of us has a responsibility both to ourselves and to each other to ensure that we remain aware and alert to the tactics of any adversary that may, and the tactics that they might use against us. As I previously said, our adversaries will not fight a fair fight and they simply will not wait for us to be ready as a nation. Our strategic competitors are very thoughtful in their overarching strategies. The question is, are we? This should prompt every one of us to ask ourselves, how can I make a difference in the organization that I'm in today? How can I help our nation to be better? And the question that I ask myself as a Chief Master in the Air Force is how can I make a difference in preparing the Air Force and preparing our airmen to be ready for anything that our nation may need when they call upon us? And it is not lost on me that my responsibility is to make sure that they are. It's our nation's airmen who stand watch 24 seven to ensure that America's airmen, that Americans everywhere are able to rest well and sleep well at night. And as I mentioned before, it's truly because of your support, partnership, your advocacy, and your influence to our Air Force and the whole of nation approach that will help us and is needed now more than ever. I'm convinced, ladies and gentlemen, that the challenges that we face today and in the years to come will not be won in a, by a speech. It will not be won in a room in the Pentagon Capitol Hill, or in a boardroom, they will be solved by our people. The airmen serving in today's Air Force, your Air Force, are part of the most, are part of the most talented, educated, and innovative force in history. They are the senior leaders of tomorrow. The Air Force that they inherit is being built right now, and we have to deliver. In my position, I often focus on where are we today? Where do we need to go in the future? What are the gaps that we have? What are the things that we have to do now? And most importantly, are we moving fast enough? So as I engage our airmen, I challenge every single one of them that it is their time that they've got to step in the arena and get to work. I challenge them to make a difference in their organization, to make our Air Force better, to make our nation better, make their communities better. And quite honestly, I also tell them that I don't, it doesn't matter to me if they serve four years, six years, 28 years. Um, it, that just doesn't matter too much. What I share with them is while they wear this uniform, they have a nation that is absolutely counting on them. They're counting on them to have high moral character. They are counting on them to be agile, resilient, innovative, and critical thinkers. They're counting on them to win and to outthink our competitors in the most challenging and lethal environments. And while we are counting on them, they are counting on me and other leaders to remove those barriers so that they can absolutely serve to, the, to, to their full potential. 
So I remain focused on retraining, retaining the talent that we have and recruiting the best that America has to offer. And again, that's where you come in. We cannot do this without you. So your help in sharing our Air Force story, C-130 and all, and supporting those who serve really does have a direct impact on our ability to retain and recruit America's sons and daughters. I might inject that whether you're in the military or not, our call to serve our nation in whatever capacity has never been stronger. When I talk with our airmen, I often remind them that service has got to be more than just a job. It is a commitment, it is an honor, it is a sacred duty, and our nation, again, is counting on them to stop navigating in a fractured world, instead to start mending it together. I'm encouraged, again, to be in a room full of folks like you, full of people who care deeply about our nation and care deeply about our world. As for me, it is my high honor to serve in the world's greatest Air Force alongside the world's greatest airmen defending the world's greatest nation. And it is especially an honor to speak with you as you close out an amazing week um, focused on navigating in a fractured world. And as I close, I'd like to share one of my favorite quotes from President John F. Kennedy. There are risks and costs to action, but they are far less than the long range risks of, of comfortable inaction. And if I can just repeat it and paraphrase it in my own words, there are absolutely risks and costs to action, but those risks are far less than the long range risk of doing nothing. So now is the time for action. And I can guarantee you that your Air Force is taking action and we will do our part to defend this great nation. However, it is this whole of nation approach that is needed now more than ever. It is upon each of you, each of us to do our part and be about action. And with that, let's get after it. Thank you. And I think we have time for questions and answers. Is that what we're going to do? Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much. That thank was you. Really excellent. Very concise and very impressive. I would love to ask you how many women, or what percentage of your Air Force are women, and what you think the impact of women has been on the Air Force and on the military. We have about 21% women in the United States Air Force, and I think the impact's been great. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you asked my husband, who served 27 years in the Army, by the way, I tell him actually the Air Force could be run by just women. Um, <laughs> no, what, what I will say is, right, we, we take diversity and inclusion in the military very seriously. And the reason why is we, you know, we know for certain it is a fact that you are, you know, high performing teams are diverse teams. And so anytime you can, um, you can, you know, exploit the great talents that people bring to the force um, through diversity. And diversity is not just diversity of demographics, but it is certainly diversity you know, of demographics, of cognitive, of experiences. We are doing our best in the United States Air Force to capture all of that. And, and we have you know, countless examples of amazing um, female airmen. They are airmen first, but, but female airmen who've just paved the path. Uh, thank you. Uh, my nephew just joined the, the uh, Air Force about, about, what, about two months ago. So um, what, where, where do you see the future of the Air Force going in the sense that basically what should I tell him to study? I, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't... I'm sorry. Yeah, my, my nephew just entered the Air Force just like about a month or two ago. What should I tell him to be trying to, to specialize in? Do you, you see yourself like I'm looking at like drones, uh, pilotless vehicles, things like that. Do you think that's the future? So he just joined. Is he, he already in? He's already in. What, yep. what is he doing? Um, do you want to oh, what a PJ. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is, do, do you know what he's doing now, or is he? He literally just went through like boot camp. So I mean. Oh, he's in boot Lakeland, camp now. Lakeland. Lakeland. Yeah, I was in Lakeland. I think he just finished it. He has a job probably assigned to him already. If he's in basic training, we we're put, all of our airmen know what jobs they're going to do. So I'm going to tell you, tell him to be the best airman he can be, and then, <laughs> and in whatever job that's going to be. 
what we're offering and what we're really pushing toward is when our airmen have an opportunity to re-enlist after their four or six years, we've got to think of talent management in a different way where now we can capitalize on that and offer different jobs throughout our Air Force because most airmen, just like me 30 years ago, didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to serve in our military. Um, we're looking at those options and then um, there's certainly great, I mean, every single um, functional community in our Air Force is important to enabling air power, but it really it matters, you know, what really matters most is, you know, what is he interested in, what's he passionate in, and then we can help get him there. Great, thank you. Yes. Nancy Hamlin, Rochester, New York. Yes, ma'am. To what degree does the United States Air Force coordinate activities with the Navy Air Force, with the Army Air Force? I mean, every branch of service has an Air Force. Yes, ma'am. And to what degree are they coordinated? Are you the super chief and they are under you? Or, or do they each think they're super chiefs? I'm sure they do. I think <laughs> that's anyway, a great idea. What kind um, of coordination? They wouldn't think so. No, um, I know that. I just, <laughs> to what degree are they coordinated? Yes, ma'am. So I should go back and tell the Army that they are Army Air Force and Navy Air Force. So, they, so there is only one United States Air Force. There is one U.S. Army, one Navy, et cetera. But, but all of those, those um, services have an aviation component to them, right? The Marines do, the Navy does, and um, certainly the, Ar the Army does as well. But there's one Air Force. What's pretty interesting, a kind of fun fact, is when Top Gun released, um, our, our, our recruiting numbers hit the roof because everybody thought that was Air Force, but that was Navy, but that's okay. We took it. Um, so we took a whole lot of airmen into the Air Force, you know, over Top Gun. We love it. Um, but, but to that degree, you have the Department of the Defense um, that is really the overarching umbrella. And then you have the services, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, and now again, as I mentioned, the Space Force, who is three years old. Um, and then, of course, we do a lot of work with our Coast Guard brothers and sisters. Um, we are more integrated than we ever have before. You know, in fact, if you look at our study, our national defense strategy, and, and um, you know, we're focused on that integration um, to be able to deter, right? Our adversaries, um, any that we have, are not interested in beating the United States Air Force. They are interested in beating our nation. And so we have to be integrated um, jointly as a service, but I would offer more importantly interagency with our CAA, with our other brothers and sisters that are serving in other agencies to be able to be our very best. Uh, given what's going on in uh, Ukraine right now with a lot of usage of drones, what do you think is the future of drone warfare? Um, so, you know, I mentioned some of those things now. I think that um, some of the adversaries, and I'll just talk right about the PRC, um, they're probably our most sophisticated adversary, period. That is why there is a sense of urgency um, in the Pentagon like no other with respect to, um, with respect to China, the PRC. Um, and I think that they are smart. They are watching the conflict happening in Ukraine right now. They are taking note at the missteps of certainly what Russia has done. And, and they're just, they're, when, when I talked about in my keynote, um, competitors who are exercising their strategies well, China is one of them. You know, China has been pretty open on everything that I'll say is unclass open source. But China's been really smart about executing their strategy. In fact, they have a 100 year strategy. Um, and, and they've put a stake in the ground that in the year 2049, they will take their rightful stand to be the world dominant power. Like, Americans need to know this. And if you talk to most of our intel folks, what they'll tell you is they're actually about 15 to 20 years ahead of time. So if you do the math, we're talking 2029 to be the world dominant power. Um, really masterful at that. And, and ha what is their strategy? To take note of what our strengths are and to make sure that they can you know, defeat those things. And so, as I mentioned in my keynote, if, if an adversary can beat us in cyber, space, or information, they stand the chance of winning. And so we've got to be focused on all ways of warfare. And it is concerning, and I shared that at lunch um, um, just a few minutes ago, like, we fight fair. Our adversaries don't. And so we have to be thoughtful of that. Uh, hi, I have uh, a question really following right on that. Um, 
I recently attended a lecture by Admiral Fago, and he demonstrated very clearly how China is uh, outspending us yeah. on, I mean, just in coins, uh, outspending us on um, building up its, its Navy and Absolutely. Air Force. Uh, so you need more money in the budget? Um, Will that do it? <laughs> what, else, what else do we need? I feel need? like I'm I on mean, testimony at the, on the Hill right now. I'm like, I'm about to start sweating. Um, no, well, well, okay. but it, it seems so stark. Uh, so, uh, so it, it, what else do you need? So when I, when I talk about the whole of nation approach, that's where, that's where you all come in and your ability to help influence those things. Your militaries can only do what we can with the defense budget that we have. Like, we all need to know that. And, and we all, we all, most of us, well, some of us are a little bit younger and don't know what a checkbook is, but most of all have had to balance a checkbook. And you can only do so much with a checkbook. And so we have got to modernize our force and we've got to have a budget to be able to do it. Because as you mentioned, China is out modernizing, you know, trying to outpace us. Their Navy has grown about two to 300% in the last 10 years alone. Um, you know, their quality is not the same, but their quantity far exceeds. Um, and that brings great concern. And so our military, right, our competitive advantage is our people, but we've got to have the, the weapons and um, the ability to deter. Hello, my name is Tulsi. I'm one of the student scholars here. I go to SMU in Dallas. Um, my brother is also a veteran, so thank you for your service, thank first you. of all. Um, so there's a show called Madam Secretary that was on CBS, and one of the episodes, which I really do like the show, they talked about how the main character in the, who plays the president, she had to address the military and how artificial intelligence was being used on in battle and whether or not the military is pushing ethics and moralities about setting in artificial intelligence to actually combat um, in places otherwise the military might hesitate in sending in individuals. And so you've been talking about drones in Ukraine and the future of what the Air Force could do. Could you perhaps elaborate on your personal perspective of how artificial intelligence could or could not be used by the greater military and specifically the Air Force? I mean, we're absolutely using those things, um, you know, when it comes to capitalizing on the technology that we have here. Um, we have a lot of um, uh, technology and machines um, that are helping us to get after things. But again, it kind of gets back to that earlier question on you have to have a budget that helps us to be able to do the research and the development for those things. And so there are a lot of um, classified projects that we are working on to make sure that we are exactly where we need to be. Um, again, those things will take the budget to be able to do so, but um, we are, I mean, the United States Air Force, again, known for being the most technologically savvy service to include space, are all very much getting after the our IA um, opportunities that we have. Thank you. Thanks. I am Gina Malasson with Gulf Coast Diplomacy in Pensacola, Florida. Mm -hmm. I am thinking about uh, cybersecurity and drones, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering as the young, the, the health of our uh, younger populations isn't as it was in the past. Mm -hmm. So with the increase of people not being able to, to pass like a physical fitness, mm -hmm. what's being done about that? It, are you going to make a special for people who are really good at computers, but who wouldn't be able to pass a physical a PT test? Is there a special track for them? Or how, what, what are we as a country, or what is, the, what is the military going to do? Because that's going to be, I imagine it's probably a stressor right now, Yeah, a challenge. You bring up a very great topic that we talk about often. Um, you know, when most of us were kids, when, you know, 30 years ago when I joined the Air Force, I mean, we hung outside and, and we played and we ran and we did things. And now we're finding most of um, the generation that's coming in today, like play, but it's a different kind of play. And, um, you know, and we are seeing in our basic training, like lots of kind of um, extremity issues and, you know, broken bones and, you know, can't do it. But we have programs in which we can help train and get people to where they need to go. Um, 
there is a, there's always talk on how do we manage talent better, how do we retain, should we have different standards, and you know, some of the services do have different standards for their medical community and or their cyber community, so we're assessing all of those things um, on what we have to do, but we have to be cautious too, because you know, as I mentioned, we're a, we're a profession of arms, like there are still standards um, for which, you know, we are not just asked to be a cyber specialist, but we are an airman, and, and we've got to be able to have airmen who are willing to do the things that we ask them to do. So we're balancing, you know, where we need to go in the future with at the end of the day, we're still a uniform force asked to do the things that most Americans will never have to do. But for those um, highly technical fields, you know, like cyber, that we need to capitalize on that talent, we will figure out ways to bring them in as in the civilian. And as I mentioned, right, I, I, I um, really represent 800 or 685,000 airmen, uniformed or not, we have about two, over 200,000 um, airmen, we call them airmen, but they're civilians supporting the United States Air Force, and that is what I might offer as a great place for them to serve. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Uh, there's been a great deal of change in uh, you know, the world situation here in the U.S. military. You look at uh, Afghanistan and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. What has that done for morale in the, in the services? I mean, how do you sense that? I think some people thought there might be a break, and now we're in the middle of a big conflict in, 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 in Europe, at least, is uh, supporting Ukraine. So what's, what has that done for morale? Um. You know, from the seat that I sit in, I don't think that it has decreased morale at all. In fact, I find that when we are in conflict, uh, morale tends to increase because you're actually doing the things that you were trained to do, and there's a sense of purpose. And so I'm not seeing that at all. I see morale tend to decrease when um, we're not in conflict and we don't have that sense of purpose and kind of the woes of what's happening outside of our fence line that I mentioned to you start to impact us. That's when we start to see the, the, the challenges kind of really weigh heavy on our airmen. Hi, uh, Jonathan Gutierrez. I'm a volunteer here at the World Affairs Council of America. Uh, you've talked about how the landscape has changed with combat in terms of including space, cyber, and information yeah. and taking it more seriously. Uh, can you attest to how quickly those things have changed within the last 20 years uh, and how the military has adapted to that? Yeah. Um, I think the military has adapted to it as well as our nation has adapted to it, right? Like, I mean, just being honest, especially when it comes to information, um, cyber, all of those things. Um, you know, the military is really kind of a microcosm of the greater um, government. Um, but we're getting after it because we realize that those are all war fighting domains and we really have to take them serious. But that's kind of, you know, one of the, you know, when I talked to my team about um, coming here to speak, I was like, I, I, we've got to spend time with our industry leaders, those in academia, because we have to start to get left of challenges, right? When they become challenges in the military, it's too late. You know, how do we start to teach America's children about information warfare so that we can start to prepare, you know, folks left? And so, um, you know, I think that we are responding appropriately. Certainly we are in space. We're leading um, the charge in space. In fact, the, as the U.S., um, as the Department of the Air Force stood up the Space Force, we have now helped influence, I think, eight or 10 other nations to also start space forces. And that is, again, from the United States Air Force. Hi, uh, Roy Gutman from Baltimore. Um, I oh, heard you yeah. talk about uh, the whole of nation approach, but I have to confess I don't really understand yeah. what that means. You know, in war, uh, you see a whole-of-nation approach. Yeah. We see it in Ukraine today. Yes. Um, as far as I can see, this is a nation more or less at peace with risks coming down the road. Yeah. But um, I'm not, not quite sure what whole-of-nation means in, uh, to, to a nation at, at peace. I think that we always want to remain a nation at peace, and it'll take all of us to really get after that. Like, the number one goal for us is to deter. We do not want to go into conflict with China. That is not going to be a good conflict. Like, every, everybody needs to know that. Like, and the only way that we can do that, as I mentioned, you know, China's not interested in beating the Air Force. They're interested in beating the nation. And so if they can 
um, challenge us economically, if they can challenge us through other ways, um, then they can win. And so that's where, right, we need, and, and how do we deter? Our military is, is a strong deterring factor, but we can only deter if we have, if we're modernized enough and we have enough stuff to be able to deter. You know, and that's where, you know, when I start thinking of whole of nation too, I think about our in industrial base. You know, do we even have an industrial base today that can help us modernize the weapon systems that we're gonna need? Do we have the industrial base that if we did go into conflict with another nation that we even have the munitions um, to be able to compete long term. Ukraine, you know, I mean, I don't think anybody really thought that this conflict would last as long as it has, and they have went through lots of munitions. Um, I, I will tell you that if we go into conflict with China, we will expend a lot of munitions, and do we have a nation that is prepared to be able to multiply that to what we're gonna need. And that's, so that's what I start talking about, about whole of nation approach. The other whole of nation approach is academia. You know, it is a fact, again, unclass open source, it is a fact that every 10-year-old, um, every primary age kid in China is learning how to code. Um, and if you think about that, if every kiddo in China is learning how to code, what does that mean in 10 years from now? You have millions of folks who know how to code and know how to get after cyber effects in a way that we may not be able to defend if our U.S. children aren't learning that. So this is where like schools, communities, industry, we've got to come together, shared values, and really get after being the strong nation that we are. And in the information space, let me tell you, China pays a whole lot of attention to the silliness that happens, you know, on social media and the information age, and they are doing that to exploit us and to cause division. If, if you read that article that I mentioned that I wrote, I talk about that, 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 that division that other um, nations will seek to cause in the information age. Yes, sir. Thank you. And that leads me to my next question. We've got a lot of young people who are attending the conference this year. And I'm sorry, I didn't thwart a terrorist attack. I, I crashed last night. But, yes. <laughs> um, but the young people here in the room are typically college students. What advice would you give them for an academic field of study? And what is the typical path for joining the Air Force? Do you enlist out of high school? Do you get a four-year degree and enlist as an officer? What, would, what advice would you give the students here today? That's a tough question, ma'am, because, you know, um, I have a 22-year-old, by the way, who's graduating in a few weeks. Um, Lord willing, let's pray. Uh, but, 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 but what I've had to learn is, like, every, every young adult has to pave their own way. And, and what my way is different, certainly different than my kiddo's way. And so whether you want to... Um, be somebody like me who just want to figure out life in the military, that's, that's a great option too. Or if you want to do four years and come in as an officer, that's an option. I think everybody has to design their own path and figure out what that might look like. And as far as what to study, well, certainly as a, um, you know, in my position, I'm really focused on STEM. And I'm really focused on we need uh, Americans to be excited about those things because they're going to matter in the long run. But I think more than that, I would encourage our folks to really be thoughtful in, in what they're doing and, and do something that they're passionate about too. Thank you. I'll do a quick commercial break on that note. You know, um, you know the, the TikTok version that um, China has for their kid for that, that is appropriate to 14 years old and younger is different than the version that goes out to the rest of the world. Y'all need to know that. Like the version that they get um, for their, that their 14 year olds and under get is like eating spinach. It's wholesome content and stuff that gets them excited about STEM, gets them excited to be a contributor to their nation. And the stuff that we get, well, you know what our kids are getting. And so it is not spinach, it is not that. And so when I was, I was told recently, or I read it recently, that they did a study on you know, what kiddos wanna be and if you talk to most um, American children, teenagers, they wanna be like social media influencers. And if you talk to um, folks in China, the Chinese kid wanna be astronauts. That's something the Air Force can't control. That's something that it gets after that whole of, uh, whole of nations, sir. Like we need communities to help with that. Oh. Yes, ma'am. 
Hello, I am one of the college students here at the WACA conference, and I had a question kind of regarding what the military is doing to attract and retain members of our generation. Um, in the past, you know, military recruitment was kind of a pathway to success. Um, I know my parents' generation, you know, that was a really big option for them. But these days, as you know, college enrollment is encouraged more and more in schools, um, I'm kind of wondering what the military, and the Air Force specifically, if you can attest to that, is specifically doing to attract Gen Z and to retain those members apart just from the benefits of the military. That is a question of the century. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many times we've had that discussion in the Pentagon, probably this year alone. Um, for the United States Air Force, we actually met our recruiting goals this year, um, but our Air National Guard did not, and our reserves did not. The other services are in more of a, you know, they, they, they did not, um, but our Air Force did good, and I don't take great comfort in that because that's just kind of indication of what future years could perhaps look like. Um, and so our recruiters um, and all of our services have that very challenge. Um, we're really trying to do some outside of the box thinking. In fact, um, I had dinner with my boss a few months ago and we invited some partners in the community, people who study Gen Z, academians, and, 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 and folks alike to, to say, how can we as a military service do things differently and attract folks? And, you know, I was pretty um, uh, inspired by some of the things that I learned because we talk about Generation Z, and Generation Z is actually probably the most misunderstood generation. Um, people think they don't want to serve, but they actually do. They just want to serve in their own way. And they also want to have a clear path and so as we had, our, um, we had our chief human resources officer, if you will, um, at that dinner as well, we talked about how we've got to shape the way we do talent management in the, in the military differently than we've ever done before. If our military looks the same today as it did when I came in almost 30 years ago, then that's probably not where we need to be. And so we're changing a lot of the way we do people operations. Um, we've got to look at not just retaining uh, or not just recruiting and attracting 18 and 19 year olds, we're actually getting in a whole lot of folks that are 25 years old, 32 year olds. We have people who come in with master's degrees, even PhDs. And so we've got to look at things differently. If you have ideas, I'd love to hear what they are um, because we're, we're really doing things differently, uh, more differently than we have perhaps before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll use executive privilege to become a civilian in the sense of post World Affairs Councils of America soon and ask this question that we've been struggling with and we've observed the nation has, and that concerns diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And you are first of firsts of firsts in your role, but I want to take you back to when you were an Army dependent mm. and what that meant to you in the service of the day. It's different. It looked different. And what, are the, some, what, what was your growth path through that? And how should we be thinking about DEI yeah. in our organization? So my dad, um, as you mentioned, you know, I'm an Army brat, um, Army dependent. My dad served um, for 24 years. And so all I ever knew was the military. And it was really um, inspiring because you work, you serve with um, other military kiddos. And our military is really diverse. And so I saw different flavors of people my entire life. Um, and so that was what I was used to. That was what I was accustomed to. Um, which helped, I think, shape who I was as I joined the military, knowing that that's pretty normal and natural. And what we found in the military is that it just makes us a stronger force, that, um, that diversity that we have, and that's why we encourage that diversity. But we have to really balance that out with, um, you know, why? Why does diversity matter and, and what is it? And for the Air Force, diversity is a war, war fighting imperative because it makes us more effective. We can't just seek diversity just because for diversity's sake. Like everybody has to earn it, right? And everybody um, has to be qualified first. And, you know, it's interesting when, I, when people introduce me or, or say, you know, she's the first female or the first Asian American, like until I got in this position, I never thought about that. Right, like I never thought um, I'm a 
I'm a woman, right? Like, um, I'm an airman, and, and I never thought, you know, I'm an Asian, you know, you're an airman. And so it's interesting because that's where I talk about kind of the information warfare. Labels get put on you, but at the end of the day, we're all airmen. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, Chief Back. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I was too fast because we have a photographer, so after some brief remarks, I'd love a, a photo with you if you don't mind. Um, first of all, I want to thank again Chief Bass and her team, Chief Master Sergeant Perry, Diamond One, and Sergeant Vaughn and Sergeant Holt for putting this all together. Really appreciate you. Uh, I would like my team to come up and I'm going to say a few things and then we'll close and that includes not just Kayla, but <laughs> Balner, Veronica, Jonathan, Jonah, are you here? Jonah from Connecticut came down. <laughs> Who am I missing? Each side of me. All right. Um, yesterday evening, Waka Chair Glenn Kramer cited my energy, and I have to say, yes, I'm energetic. Uh, I get my energy from all you, all of you, every day for 10 years, actually 15 if you include my time at World Boston. All of them, they show me every day what hard work means, and it pays off, and it results in events like this. So first of all, applaud these guys. Kayla, Jonathan, Veronica, Balner, and Jonah, wherever you are. Um, I would like the student scholars to please stand up. <laughs> or, any, or any intern or young staff at councils, for that matter, if there are more, OK? Um, Chief. <laughs> Chief Bass, your daughter is about to graduate. My daughter is a year for, away from that myself. These youngsters are going to enter the world soon. And uh, so am I. I'm a very young man. And uh, in, in, in a way, I'm going to let my hair down again and give a commencement speech to them and to myself. Okay? You asked a very important question that I think about every day, which is how can I make a difference in my organization today, or for that matter, your life. And so I have uh, put together perhaps a very trite list of things that I think are, is the answer to that question. And this is what I would say to my daughter, and therefore it is what I would say to all of you. Trust in yourself. Be eternally curious. Do your best always and take pride in hard work and a job well done. If your work is ungainly at first, come at it another way. If you fail, have no fear, everybody does. Reflect, show up, and bring a positive mind. When you have lemons, make lemonade. We did that so many times this conference. Sometimes you saw it, sometimes you didn't even know, but we did. That's sort of a play on the, the, the JFK quote, which is really to take risks and you'll get a good outcome because if you don't, you won't get any outcome. Last but not least, remember the golden rule. There's no other rule like it. That's the one that counts and trust in yourself. Thank you for this journey. So because I've heard this is his last one, Bill, have you ever gotten a military coin? I have not. Oh, let me say, yesterday, General Philippe gave me an oval, which is his rugby 
uh, coin with the NATO insignia on the back. Is that in a military coin? Because I'm a rugby player. So that, that was, but it's not as cool as mine. Um, <laughs> worry about that. We're, we're not worried about that. This, this one right here. Um, but, you know, th this is my personal coin um, that says people readiness and culture. Um, it says that we're better together. And so oh, yeah. thank you so much for your leadership to this organization. And thanks for bringing me down. And it'd be my honor to give you my coin. But, but we do have rules in the military. So if you don't know what they are, some of y'all may. If you drop a coin, it's not going to be good. Um, it, that means he owes drinks. So, um, so, don't, so don't drop I this do coin. Anyway. Don't drop this coin because it's going to cost you a lot. But you'll grab it the way I show you, right? like this, like that, and okay. there's your coin. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do I put it in my pocket? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Safe flights wherever you're going. Happy Thanksgiving. Goodbye. I'll see you sometime. <laughs>